All right, good afternoon from uh, Northern California, sort of sort of near the foothills of the Sierras, uh, over here in an area where the uh, cancerous urban sprawl kind of overlaps with borderline oak woodland habitat out here. And we're, we're kind of sitting in the middle of a managed area. There's a public park above this little above this little berm here and uh, I'm kind of just walking around trying to quarantine myself away from the quarantine if that makes any sense and uh, just do some biologizing uh, at this little spot right here so uh, you kind of feeling a little bit uncomfortable with all these people around me they're gonna be hearing me talk but uh, well you know who gives a shit yeah so uh, every landscape tells a story no matter how big or how small uh, right here I can see that this was probably built up as a uh, kind of like a rock wall or they just had a bunch of river stone that they just piled up here and then this path was probably just created by people just walking over it through the years and uh, after leaving this alone a lot of the species of vegetation that can easily take advantage of such a, a recently disturbed area is a lot of the non-natives and uh, this this patch of hillside here is pretty much exclusively non-native vegetation. And this non-native vegetation is favored by a lot of the uh, animal life, which could either be non-native or native. Wherever these plants were from, whether it be Europe or China or Africa, uh, they found a nice home to establish themselves here in Northern California. And uh, it seems like they got a pretty good gig going on here with all these pollinators or potential pollinators that are here to help them propagate. But yeah, so first and foremost, one of the most noticeable plants out here is this purple one these purple flowers type of uh, wild pea uh, it is not native to California uh, I believe it is a native from Europe but it seems to do pretty well here and uh, you can see up in there you know the European honeybees which is also a non-native species doesn't mind uh, taking advantage of the nectar reserves that this plant has and uh, which ultimately uh, causes fertilization or pollinization, I guess, when it comes to plants, uh, for this plant to propagate and uh, survive and thrive in uh, North America's climate. Okay, here's one that you might be used to. This is a vena or wild oat. I don't know if it's a vena fatua or vena barbata. There's two species in California, both of them introduced, uh, and both of them do well everywhere throughout the entire state. Matter of fact, this plant is pretty much introduced across the entire country because you know oats come from Europe they use oats to feed horses and livestock and you know when you bring something like that over you'll get a stray seed that just seems to propagate and populate itself somewhere else and then the more land gets disturbed the better these guys are at taking advantage of that disturbed land and this one you can actually eat these not right now it's still developing the uh, the granule or the seed inside but when they get dried out you can actually pry these open and find a little itty bitty oat granule and eat it and it does it really does taste like oats uh, this is a plant where you know if you see it yeah go ahead and eat it I don't care you know it's not a native plant it's an introduced one you know, you can eat as much of these and you probably won't do any impact to to its population size or or any other individual oat at that but yeah a vena wild oat all right so this one right here this is a genuine asshole plant right here this is Bromus diandris or ripgut brome. Horrible, horrible invasive from Europe. They call it ripgut because if you take your hands and you rub it this way, it seems pretty smooth. But if you try to rub it the other way, there are these little micro barbs on these awns here. I guess a lot of cows or horses, whenever they eat this, like those little sharp barbs can really screw up your digestional tract, hence why they call it rip gut. But anyway, again, this is another plant adapted to the disturbance of a, of, a, of a certain land area. And once it gets disturbed, these guys have the advantage of, uh, of actually populating it before other plants. These are very fast growing. They grow seasonally, meaning they, you know, they sprout up during the late winter and the spring, uh, grow, die off probably around midsummer but then their seeds are all viable their seeds populate the seed bank and they can be the first ones to pop up once you get rains or whatnot the following year and uh, they do really well in disturbed areas because when a disturbed area is disturbed you know you're taking out a lot of topsoil taking out a lot of uh of, of land mass of biomass and everything and bromus diandris 
has evolved a life history or a biological strategy to take advantage of events that happen like that. Grasses in general, grasses in general, I mean, grasses are pretty new to the evolutionary scale relatively compared to a lot of other plants. So uh, they do pretty well and they've basically kind of uh, evolved a commensal relationship with human activity, you know, because humans disturb stuff and uh, these guys will be right there behind the human disturbance to take advantage of that. Horrible, horrible invasive though. If you ever see this, you know, you should kill it. And uh, of course you can see how much this, uh, this Avena can uh, really take over some stuff. The Bromus can do that too. They're just, they're just really good at uh, overtaking land and overtaking space, choking out any competitors that might want that space too. It's a real pain in the ass for, for any type of restoration ecologist to deal with because these plants are incredibly tenacious incredibly aggressive growing too okay so even though we got all these non-natives here there is still a resilient native species that is also here and it is this individual right here this is claytonia perfoliata in the montiaceae family this is a nice native native californian plant it is edible uh, and a lot of it does go around especially in uh little shady hillsides and uh, I guess uh, all this non-native uh, over canopy, I guess you would call it. I mean, well, like it creates a canopy layer and uh, underneath the canopy layer, it's pretty shady. And these guys like shady uh, kind of moist habitats or temporarily moist habitats. And uh, it seems that this, uh, this canopy of non-native uh, vegetative uh, intrusion has created a, a nice micro habitat for this native plant to kind of thrive however i do kind of question uh the successfulness of its pollination uh by its native pollinators just because it's underneath all this nasty invasive veg usually when you see them out in uh, natural areas these guys aren't really covered by anything uh, but anyway other than that these guys are apparently a good source of vitamin c uh, I've tasted it before. Kind of tastes like uh, really rich spinach. Not a bad taste at all. Good to make a salad out of. Uh, but but please don't be going out there ripping up native plants just to just to make a meal for yourself. They do much better out in the wild where they can ecologically function on their own. All right, all right. Here we go. Here we go. We're gonna try to do this. I'm gonna try to do this. Be smooth. And I think I got it. Yep. Here we go. Okay, so here we got a pretty nice late example of Batis philonor, family Papillionidae, uh, Lepidoptera, and that's uh, butterflies and moths, for those of you who don't know. Uh, the genus Batis uh, ranges all the way from North America to Central America, I believe. And these guys are, are pretty ubiquitous up here in Northern California. Their host plant is something called a, a California pipe vine, I think. I forget what family it's in, but it, it's it's got a pretty uh, uh, narrow range of uh, host species for its uh, caterpillar. And see the classic uh, Papillionidae swallowtail because they have these little divots on its. Uh, oh, it just flew away. Oh, well, a lot of birds around here too. I'm I'm hearing uh, white-throated swifts, California towhees, and his hummingbird. Seems like there's a morning dove in the distance over there. Oh, there goes another butterfly. Let's go get it. We got one right there. Got him, coach. And those nice under hind wing patterns right there. Getting these little divots that come off of the hind wings. Just indicative of uh, the family Papillionidae, the family of swallowtails. And look at this nice proboscis right here. Evolutionary uh, modification of the mandibular mouth part system in insects. Pretty crazy. And of course, with introduced vegetation, you can get some introduced uh, animal life that come along with it. Right there, we got, I think that is the Chinese lady beetle, an Asian introduced species. And uh, this guy, th th these guys do do a pretty good job of uh, controlling aphid, pop uh, aphid populations and other er insect herbivore populations. Problem with these guys, by the way, they're in the family Cosinellidae, the family of lady beetles or ladybirds a lot of people call them ladybugs but they're not true bugs 
they're beetles. Their larvae are actually voracious predators. As adults, they're pretty, they're pretty good predators too. Uh, it turns out when they were introduced here, I think they were introduced here specifically to help combat herbivores on, uh, on a lot of our agricultural plants. But uh, it turns out that they kind of outcompete native lady beetles too. So it's crazy how uh, species can get transported into different areas and do really well and be and do really poorly wherever they're from. But these guys seem to do pretty well here. More, more introduced stuff inside introduced stuff. So as I'm uh, trampling through here, you can see all these things flying around, all these little itty bitty small insects. Let me see if I can get one close up. Alright, so what we got here is a member of the Cicadelidae or uh, leaf hoppers. A lot of Cicadelids are herbivorous species. They have that nice stylate, hostilate mouth part, which is most like, it, which, which means it's a, a piercing mouth part, which means they like to pierce through the stems and leaves of plants and uh, they basically just kind of suck out the moisture and the water. They extract the sugar from all that water, which they in turn use as energy. There's a species related to these known as the glassy wing sharpshooter, which is a horrible pest on grapes, especially here in California. There are billions of dollars going in to eradicate those things. So it kind of goes to show you how a lot of the smaller organisms create some of the biggest impacts that impact our human lives. Because, you know, we got to have that grape because we got to have that wine. Okay, here we have an example of uh, a mating ritual between two Hymenopteran species. They look like they're in the family Megachilidae, the Megachilid bees. And uh, looks like this male is uh, pretty intent on uh, sharing its genome with this female. You can see there with his uh, intermittent organ, he's trying to he's trying to get it in. Is oh man, he's going to town right now. Uh, typically the male is smaller than the female. That's all the male's job is to pass on sperm and the female has the real job of uh, taking care of the babies, you know, obviously supplying the eggs and, and, and new young nutrients and all that. But yeah, it looks, looks like he won.